Good morning, folks, and welcome to this Sunday morning worship from Livingston Elam Church. And uh, it's uh, Sunday, July the 26th, and uh, we are still Sunday worship at home, but uh, looking to the next few weeks to uh, maybe coming together in the church building and uh, many churches in a similar uh, footing at the moment as we look to the government guidelines, as we look to um, Elam headquarters um, advice and uh, uh, we'll keep you posted regarding that. But today we're at home uh, once again and uh, we pray that today will be a blessing to you and that you'll be encouraged, strengthened, comforted, perhaps challenged as well. Let's just begin by reading uh, a portion of scripture from Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't, can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's one of my uh, most favourite uh, portions of scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. And Dave is going to lead us uh, once again uh, with uh, an anthem of declaration, Shout to the North. It encourages men of faith uh, and uh, women of truth to rise up to stand, to sing, and declare the majesty, the love, the power, the healing that is found in Jesus, the Saviour to all, who is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the God who reigns on high, and it is by his grace that we can do this, that we can sing and declare. So let's pray just as we gather together. Father, we come together in the precious name of Jesus, and we seek to lift up our voices and to declare uh, with this song that God you are Lord of all, that Jesus is Saviour to all and we pray that your grace will permeate our lives from first to last in Jesus name. Amen. I 
rise up church, rise up church with broken wings, fill this place with songs again, of our God who reigns on high, by His grace again we'll fly. Thanks, Dave, for leading us in that great song. Over the past uh, months, we have been doing Word at One, and uh, for the past number of weeks, we have been uh, looking at the Psalms, and people have been taking it in turns to just read a Psalm, maybe pray, or maybe share a little bit about that particular Psalm. And we have been blessed by the fact that Ian White has given us permission to use the Psalms that uh, he um, produced in some cases uh, over 30 years ago um, to accompany these psalms and they've been a real blessing to us that is for sure i think we're um, done or 40 psalms over the last uh, 10 or 11 weeks that we have been doing this uh, maybe more to be honest and uh, psalm 8 is an, one of those psalms that has been on my heart these last few days and uh, it's a psalm that exalts the majesty of God as being great beyond words and worthy of our fervent worship and allegiance. And that majesty uh, is manifest in the glory of God's supreme creation, humankind, human beings who are made in his image. And John Piper, an American uh, Baptist preacher and author, he says this, the truth of this vision of God and man is this in relation to Psalm 8. You cannot worship and glorify the majesty of God while treating his supreme creation with contempt, whatever colour or whatever age that creation might be. And he goes on to say, you cannot starve the aged human and glorify the majesty of God. You cannot dismember the unborn human and glorify the majesty of God. You cannot gas the Jewish human and glorify the majesty of God. You cannot lynch the black human and glorify the majesty of God. And he concludes, do not join with the adversaries of God in killing unborn children or scorning any race of human being. Words that are applicable to the 21st century society that we live in. And Psalm 8 is a tremendous psalm of praise. O Lord, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name. And uh, what is man that you think of him? So let's sing this song uh, of Ian White. Uh, it will be familiar to some of us, uh, to others it may be a new song. But Psalm 8 speaks of the truth, the timeless truth, that God, our God reigns. And our God has created each and every one of us. 
and he cares for us and he loves us. So let's sing this song in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens and from the lips of children and babes. You have ordained your praise because of all your enemies to silence the foe. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I think of all your heavens, the works of your Stars which you set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Made just lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and crowned him with honor. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. You made him be a ruler, all the works of your hands, and everything put under his feet. All flocks and herds and beasts of the field, the birds that fly above in the air, and the fish of the sea. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name and all. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your Past two Sundays we've been blessed by the, the ministry of Kenny Borthwick and uh, Christopher Allen. And, uh, Today I am going to continue with uh, looking at the book of Daniel. We'd only concluded the first chapter of that. Um, so we're going to look at chapter 2 today. And all through the Bible, God uses dreams to lead his people. Two of the best known dreams are found in Genesis. In chapter 28, Jacob at Bethel is assured of uh, God's presence. And in chapter 37, Joseph rather unwisely, it has to be said, shares uh, his God-given dreams with his brothers. If we jump to the New Testament too, in Matthew 1 and 2, the other Joseph, the husband of Mary, has four very significant dreams that each give him specific guidance from the Lord. And dreams are part of the way that God communicates with his people. And today that is still the case. God still speaks supernaturally to people through dreams. And many Muslims in particular have received God-given dreams. Uh, Mission Frontiers magazine reported that out of 600 Muslim converts, 25% of them experienced a dream that led to their conversion. That's a 150, around about that number. It's a significant number. I think of the family from Kurdistan, where every member of the household had the same dream, indicating that they, they should cross a particular river the very next day, where they would receive living water. That was the, 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 the significance of that dream. And the next day, without hesitation, the whole family went across the river and they met someone. And what did he give them? He gave them a Bible. Tremendous uh, confirmation, tremendous encouragement. I think too of the Iranian man who arrived early one morning at a refugee centre who he was visibly upset and he was desperately looking for a pastor, a minister. Why? Because he'd received a vision of someone dressed in white calling him to stand up and follow me. And when he'd asked the man in the, the vision, who are you? The man replied, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the way to heaven. 
No one can go to the Father except through me. Who do you think he was referring to? This man had never seen a Bible, but when he made contact with the pastor, he was shown from the book of Revelation that this was Jesus. And the man broke down in tears saying, how can I follow him? So the pastor led him to the Lord in prayer and God's peace came over him. He left the pastor. He was in this refugee camp. He left the pastor. But an hour later, he returned with 10 more Iranian men, each of whom wanted a Bible for themselves. And the writer of that particular article notes, no one had to teach the first man an evangelistic strategy. He just shared what God had spoken to him in that dream, in that vision, and he had communicated that when he had found the Lord. Chapter 2 of Daniel is built around a dream, a terrifying dream. And uh, sometimes God speaks through nightmarish dreams. I was speaking to Pastor Jimmy Vowles um, at uh, Bathgate Elam um, this week on Zoom. And he was telling me of when he came to faith, it was a result of a dream about hell that uh, God showed him when he was in his 20s. Well, this nightmarish dream that King Nebuchadnezzar has leaves him in a very troubled state of mind. He, and remember, he's the ruler of a great Babylonian empire. He's the most powerful man on earth. But here we find him in turmoil. He's fearful of what he's experienced. He knows the dreams he had is from the spiritual realm because the Babylonians put great weight on the gods communicating with them supernaturally. And he knows this dream has great significance for his future, but it was a dream he didn't understand. Maybe because he couldn't remember much about it. Uh, but the reality is that through this dream, God is revealing the future to this pagan emperor, just as he had done to the Egyptian pharaoh centuries earlier. In fact, this dream of Nebuchadnezzar is perhaps the most important dream in the whole Bible, maybe even the whole of human history. It's an amazing revelation and uh, despite taking place around 600 BC, this passage is very relevant to where we are in the 21st century. You know, God's word stands firm and uh, uh, it's, uh, this passage points towards God's eternal purposes, in particular in relation to the coming of the kingdom of God. There are two main lessons that we can learn from this chapter. The first is the powerlessness of man and the other is the supremacy of God. And the contrast between man's impotence and God's omnipotence is in clear contrast here. With all our knowledge, all our education, there are certain questions we cannot answer. Questions like, how are things going to end? Where is the, the world heading? Questions that have become more and more focused and to the fore during uh, the, the, the COVID lockdown and the turmoil that the world is going through and will continue to go through. And the answer is that nobody knows. We don't know. Nobody knows except God. God alone knows what's in store. And in this chapter, he reveals that to Nebuchadnezzar. God is a God of revelation. He's a God who communicates uh, to those uh, who seek him. And sometimes folk, people don't really seek him. And God kind of arrests them on the road. And so troubled by the dream that he's had in uh, this chapter, the king calls all his wise men and counsellors, his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers. These are the guys he's had trained at the University of Babylon who've studied the arts, the sciences, the, the occult, uh, who this king has handpicked for service in the royal court. These are people that he's invested in, who have eaten the best of foods, have tasted the finest of wines, have lived in the most grand of surroundings, and now the king is demanding they tell him what his dream was about and what it means. The trouble is that none of them can help. They, they have no clue. They're powerless. It appears the king has either forgotten the detail of the dream or he has remembered something more of the dream but refuses to tell his counsellors because he wants to test their ability. After all, this is what he is employing them for. Whatever the situation, the counsellors plead for more time. They loudly protest their inability and the unfairness of it all. They are certainly bold in their response but they know what's coming. They know what Nebuchadnezzar is like. And true to form, the furious king judges them to be frauds. 
angrily issues the order to have them executed, which wasn't an unknown thing for a royal despot back in the, the day then. And as a result, in verse 13, we're told that because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. So we're going to pick up the chapter, chapter 2, at verse 14, and we're going to read through to verse 28. And Lynn will do that for us now. Well, good morning, everybody. And um, here's the reading for today's um, sermon. And Kenny's asked me to read uh, Daniel 2, chapter, uh, sorry, Daniel chapter 2, verses 14 to 28. And this is what it says. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God for ever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. Daniel's calmness in this situation is admirable, especially in one so young. Remember, he's only around 19 or 20 years of age. He handles the situation, we're told, with wisdom and discretion. And he again displays the same courteous courage as we saw uh, three weeks ago, he immediately requests an audience with the king. He's confident in his God, and after asking for more time from Nebuchadnezzar, he gathers his friends together and they go to prayer. They have a conviction and confidence in God that demonstrates an attitude that says, when we get to the end of what we can do, we're just at the beginning of what God can do. This is the essence of living active faith. And so together they urgently join together to pray to the God who knows everything, the Almighty God, from whom they seek wisdom, they seek the answer. And they acknowledge their impotence, their powerlessness in what they're facing. But at the same time, they acknowledge the greatness and the goodness of the omnipotence of God. I wonder if we are moved to pray like them when faced with impossible situations, unsolvable uh, issues that come before us, unsurmountable um, matters that, are, uh, that face us, mountainous difficulties. Do we, like Daniel, choose to exercise our faith in God, to seek out other like-minded individuals and join together in prayer? This is the privilege that we have in Christ, to participate in prayer, not only individually, but with others. And the book of Daniel contains tremendous lessons in prayer. Firstly, these young adults, you know, these young believers full of faith, they come before God to ask him to show them in his mercy to give them the key to the king's dream and its interpretation. 
Every petition that we bring to the Lord has to start from this place, from a, a petition that is based on his mercy, that the Lord might release to us uh, something of his undeserved blessing. And so these four guys pray together. There is great power in united prayer, even if it is only four people praying. That's about the number of folks sometimes on, on Zoom prayer meetings that uh, we've had over lockdown. Yes, we'd love to see more people coming together to pray on Zoom, but, uh, you know, four is enough. This, pe this past week I was on a revival prayer meeting where people from Aberdeen to Cardiff prayed. I was on another uh, monthly prayer meeting for West Lothian where some of the pastors uh, in Whitburn and roundabout uh, get together. I met with uh, Jimmy Vowles and uh, Keith Poynton on Thursday morning and we chatted and we prayed. Um, there's a, a prayer meeting that will be in the next uh, week or two uh, with uh, Pastor Melvin down at the Life Centre and uh, some of the other leaders with Pastor Marvin of the Filipino Church. You know, prayer is the key to revival as Yonggi Cho wrote in his book many decades ago. And it's something, prayer is something that God has been impressing upon me again. It, it, it's a simple truth. It's the foundational, it's the basic understanding. Prayer is so important. Jesus says in Matthew 18, 19 to 20, If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. That is the truth of God's word. There is power in just two or three asking together. You know, we miss out if we fail to pray, if we give up on the habit of praying. The book of James 4 Verse 2 tells us you do not have because you do not ask God. So Daniel asked his three friends to come and join him to pray. And they asked God together, collectively. And each of the, the four, in the presence of the other three, asked God for this one thing. They wanted the interpretation of the king's dream. In fact, their lives depended upon it. To bring that interpretation. You know, when we pray, we need to be specific. We need to be focused. David Pawson in his commentary on Daniel says, God loves people to ask for things together in each other's presence and he loves them all to pray together. For when the church is praying then, that is when God will move. Indeed, God only moves in response to prayer, but it's his grace that's working already in us that allows that to take place. That is a vital truth that the contemporary church often overlooks in its desire to be relevant uh, to be hip, to be uh, technologically as proficient as possible. Let us not forget that there is absolute power in prayer. A couple of years ago, when we were still in, in Kirimir, we became concerned as a church about a, a spiritualist meeting that was due to take place in the exact same hall that we met on a Sunday morning. And this spiritualist meeting was going to be taking place on a Saturday night. So what did we do? Some of us met to pray that the meeting, the spirituals meeting, would be shut down in Jesus' name. And we took authority over it. And guess what? That's what exactly happened. On the Friday, before the meeting was due to take place, we received word that it was cancelled. Thank you, Lord. I have another uh, uh, old friend, a godly man, Samuel McKibben, former leader of the Apostolic Church, now lives in Inverness and he tells on more than one occasion he has stood outside bars or nightclubs and occult shops and cursed them in the name of Jesus that they would be shut down and then several occasions he's gone back and these businesses have gone out of business and we have power in the words that we declare power in the words that we decree in prayer, whether that's a private prayer, but prayer when we come together. And prayer changes things. Have we given up on prayer? I would encourage us. Let's rediscover the power that is in prayer. All kinds of prayer. Intercessory prayer, declaratory prayer. You know, prayer that seeks the face of God. In verse 19 of this chapter, Daniel receives his answer. Yes, there's four of them praying, but only one receives the answer. 
you know, when we gather to pray, we should be happy if the answer uh, to what we've prayed for comes to one person. You know, one is enough. God is answered and he shares what is needed. He doesn't need to reveal the same thing to everyone who has prayed. That's one of the ways of God. You know, you don't have Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah moaning, well, you know, God didn't show me that, Daniel. So until he does, I can't believe you. No, they took the answer that Daniel received as being confirmation. And Daniel receives his answer lying awake at that night. It's a vision. It's, it's not a dream. And the difference between them being a dream is a picture. Uh, you see when you're asleep, a vision being a picture. You see when you're uh, awake. God throughout the Bible speaks not only in dreams, but by way of visions. In Genesis 15, the word of the Lord giving the covenant promise comes to Abraham in the form of a vision. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul receives his call to go to Macedonia again through a vision. Whilst the Apostle Peter receives guidance through a vision from heaven as to what food is acceptable. You know, dreams and vision are part of our relationship with God, our life with God. Joel 2 verse 28 tells us that with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. So if you're an old man, what dreams is God giving you? If you're a young man, what visions is the Lord sharing with you? Seriously, we need to believe that God will speak to us in dreams and visions. We need to have faith. We need to exercise faith. We need to deal with unbelief and believe that God will communicate his guidance to us in these ways. Because it's a biblical way. It's a spiritual way. Because he may want to speak to us through a vision or a dream. You know, when did we last ask him to speak to us personally, directly? Have we ever asked him to speak to us through a dream or a vision? You know, the scourge of unbelief, the sin of unbelief, particularly in the, the Western world, will limit our ability to hear God. And if we don't have faith to believe that he will, if we're sceptical or supra-rational in our way of thinking, then we will miss out on how God communicates. Lynn and I have a friend uh, who lives in Dunfermline, Heather, and uh, Heather and her husband Ian, her husband Ian studied divinity uh, at Aberdeen with me some years ago and went into the Church of Scotland ministry and uh, he's recently transferred to the AOG, Assemblies of God. And uh, Heather is a trained dream interpreter who heads up the dream house. And over the years I've put people in contact with her regarding dreams that they've had uh, that they believe are from God and you know sometimes the dreams that God gives us can be very straightforward and quite easy to interpret they may be very clear but sometimes their meaning might be more subtle or more nuanced or a bit more complex and it's good to have somebody to bounce these things off and I've um, pointed people in a direction or got in touch with Heather myself to um, you know, bring dreams to her and she has prayed about it and studied it and given her response to it. And maybe you have had maybe recurring dreams, maybe you've had dreams that you believe God is communicating something but you're just not entirely sure. Well, get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with Heather. Daniel is given a vision. He's given a revelation from God as to what Nebuchadnezzar's dream means. But instead of rushing off to tell the king, Daniel takes time to praise and pray to the Lord. He praises God for who he is, the God of all wisdom, of all power, who rules and reigns over the affairs of this world. Again, that emphasis, that emphasis which is so necessary, what is so true to where we're living in today, that we serve a God who rules and reigns over the affairs of this world. And then Daniel praises the God as the one who shares things with him, with us. He's full of thankfulness to God. You know, God loves praise. He wants us to pray together. He has ordained praise from the lips of children and from young people and from older people and middle-aged people. He wants us to praise him together for who he is and what he has done. And may each one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, engage in prayer and in praise to God. You know, we can't have too much prayer or too much praise. And 
Yes, when we come back together and meet together in the church building, there are limitations in relation to singing that are, uh, will still be with us for some time yet. But we can praise God. We don't have to just be sung praise. We can praise God in our attitude, in our posture, and lifting up our hearts to God. You know, directing our focus upon Him and praising Him. Arioch, the chief executioner in this passage, he next arrives on the scene and says to the king, I found the man. I found a man who, te who can tell you the answer. You know, it wasn't actually Ant uh, Arioch who found uh, David, Daniel. It was Daniel who found Arioch. That's what the scripture tells us. But here's a guy who wants to take some of the credit. Uh, he was maybe hoping to gain by his actions and the king might give him a, a gift or an honour. Yes, sometimes even in church there are people who want to take credit for their or someone else's actions they might say i did this or i've done that someone who some sometimes we meet people who speak too much with the i word you know it sadly reflects something of an insecurity although to be fair in this case arioch had more reason to be insecure than many because he served a king who had just issued an instruction to put all the counselors uh, to who he'd handpicked to death in contrast to Arioch, Daniel refuses to take the credit. He doesn't swagger in and announce to the king, I am the man, I've got the answer. No, rather he says, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He is humble, he is submissive. You remember he's 19, 20 years old, but he has this attitude of serving God. He already has a secure, mature faith that always points to God rather than to himself. As Daniel shows, God is the one who gets the glory in this situation. David Pawson notes, God is the real hero in this story. He is the one who answers prayer. He is the one who reveals secrets. The sovereign Lord who knows the future, the God who saves lives, the God who ultimately is in control of history. You know, history is not chaos. It is not chance, he says. It is going somewhere, and it is going where God wants it to go. So we might be living at the moment uncertain, unsure. What's the economic? What's the whole thing with Brexit? Where are things going to be? Will there be a second spike? Blah, all these sort of things, important things. But God knows the future. And as believers in Christ, we should be secure in our faith that whatever comes our way we say god let your will be done let your kingdom come let your truth be known let your love be experienced we trust in you it's a repeated message that the spirit of god wants to impress upon us today i believe so let's believe let's trust in the god and father of our lord jesus christ who still today communicates through dreams and visions he is the God who is in control of the kingdoms of the world. That's the message of Daniel. It's a message for 21st century uh, planet Earth. May we see things through spiritual eyes. May we not live in anxiety as to what the future might bring, about what might or might not happen. Rather, let's trust God. Let's dare to be a Daniel. Let us be prayerful. Let us be trusting in God. Let us be in communication with him. Let us pursue him, as A.W. Tozer wrote uh, half a century ago, so that his kingdom purposes might prevail, that God gets the glory here in West Lothian, here in Livingston, here in the nation of Scotland, in the United Kingdom, in the Western world, that his presence and his power breaks out and that his guidance is given and it's adhered to. Let his kingdom come let his will be done we pray that in jesus name next week i'm going to look at the significance of the message that god communicates to nebuchadnezzar and to which daniel uh, interprets and the consequences of that message and that will take us through the rest of chapter two amen trust you've been encouraged and strengthened by the word today let's pray 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is eternal. We thank you your word is true. We thank you that it brings encouragement. It's a timeless word. It speaks into our current situation as well as times gone by. Father, we pray that uh, you would speak to us in whatever, whatever way you choose, that you would speak to us through dreams, through visions, through your words, by your spirit, through the circumstances, through creation. There are many, many different ways, through the uh, fellow believers, through situations that uh, we come across. Lord, that your word would uh, impact our lives. And Lord, that we would take that word and that we would act upon that word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your hope that you instill in our lives to strengthen us in the innermost part of our being, to face the days ahead with courage, with fortitude, with wisdom, and with understanding. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In uh, the greatest chapter in the whole of Scripture, Romans chapter 8, uh, in verse 31, there is this declaration, If God be for us, who can be against us? Tremendous words, and that whole chapter is a, a, a veritable feast. It's a, a tremendous uh, truths that the Apostle Paul shares about the Christian faith and uh, many commentators would point to Romans 8 as being uh, the high point um, of the, the New Testament scriptures in particular. And we're going to close today by uh, singing a song from Elam Sound. Elam Sound have kindly made uh, a number of their lyric videos uh, available to us and uh, we're going to sing one that the it's called We Say Yes. And what we've heard today, may we say yes to God, yes to his ways of communicating, yes to his truth, yes to his grace, yes to his love, yes that he is uh, sovereign over all and what, that whatever uh, comes our way, that we will say, yes, God, we know that you are with us, that you're never going to leave us, you're not going to forsake us. So let's say yes to the God uh, that uh, loves us and cares for us and saved us and gave his son to die on that cross for each and every one of us. Let's say yes. Maybe you've not said yes to Jesus. Well, today, may you say, yes, Jesus, I wish to follow you. Just like that uh, Iranian man. Yes, I want to follow you. Might not know much about you, but I believe that you're the son of God, that you are the one who died on the cross and took uh, my sin upon yourself. So I want to say yes to you, that you're alive. And God will reveal himself to you. This is the truth of the word of God, the scriptures. So let's sing this great hymn, this great contemporary hymn, right now. We choose to serve you To follow where you
definitely a song that gets your toes tapping. So let's pray as we come to the end of our uh, service together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that uh, we can say yes to you. Lord, let us give us, we want to praise you, so let's say yes. We want to be thankful, so let's say yes to you. We want to lift up your name. We want to know you uh, as Lord and Saviour. We want to be channels of grace. We want to be channels of mercy and power and hope to those that we come in contact. We pray, God, for our families, that they would say yes to you, Jesus. We pray for our communities, that they would say yes to you, Lord. We pray for our nation that there would be a turning to you in repentance and in faith, saying, yes, Jesus, reveal yourself, show yourself to us. Father, I pray that you release dreams and visions in this nation, not just in Muslim nations or in uh, other parts of the world, but here in Scotland, that men and women would be convicted, that they would be uh, challenged, that they would be communicated to through dreams and visions, and that the Church of Jesus Christ would rise in prayer and lay hold of you, Lord God, and pray for the nation, pray for uh, wisdom and understanding and for vitality and for life, that there will be a revival of uh, genuine New Testament spirituality throughout this nation, from the north to the south to the east, to the West. We pray this in Jesus' precious, holy and loving name. May he bless you with his presence this week and may he, his, the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be known to you and let us give glory to God our Father in the days ahead. Amen. Well, bless you. Thanks for watching and until we meet again, either online or in person, May God draw near to you and may you draw near to him. Amen.